I wasn't really sure how I was going to fit in to TEDx today. But after listening to these talks, you know, I really think it's important to have this perspective. Because like Andrea was talking about, my technology is going to change the way we interact with the natural world. And after listening to Kenneth, my technology is going to be turned on its head by big data and how all that gets integrated. And it's also a technology that really suffers from some preconceived notions. So I hope you guys find this interesting. Um, like Stefan said, I've had a very interesting journey. I started out in science, and then I was in the military, and then I did a startup, uh, a not a, a startup in Denver that wasn't my own nonprofits, and then my own startup. So it's been quite the journey. And it all started because I like beautiful things. So beauty, I think, is critical to the way we communicate. That's not very beautiful. But that's where I work, because I'm a scientist, and I work in labs like this. And I work with organisms that look like that. Now, when you look at this plate, of a microorganism. It's difficult to just look at it and say, oh, I can see the future. I can see the wonder and the promise of science right there in that white dot. But there is wonder and there is promise in science, especially in biotechnology, which is why I got into it. And I wanted to share that excitement that I feel about science in a much more tangible and accessible way that was easy just to look at and see. I wanted to make biotechnology Beautiful. So I started Revolution Bioengineering to make flowers that change color. These are living flowers that change color throughout the day. And our first design, you can see it here, is a flower that goes from white to pink when you add ethanol to it. So you can share a beer with your garden. This is a scientist collaborator, collaborator in the Netherlands working on one of our lab prototypes. Our second design is a flower that, is, that will change color throughout the day, from pink to blue and back again. And you don't have to do anything with this one. You can just put it in the ground, and it will follow the sun. Now, there's a little bit of magic here. It's a little bit special. It's a different kind of beauty that nobody's seen before because I made it. It's something new. There's something we engineered. There's something that we're building. And just to be really, really clear, about what that means. I am genetically modifying these flowers to incorporate the color change. I am making a GMO. And I'm making a beautiful GMO. Now, those are two words you probably never thought you'd hear in the same sentence together. Because when we talk about GMOs, we talk about something that looks like this. Isn't this an eloquent picture of the way we think about GMOs today? And what this picture says to me, it says three very distinct things. It says, first, that the people that made this don't know what they're doing. They just stapled two pieces of fruit together. That doesn't make any sense at all. The next thing it says is that biotechnology is unnecessary. Pears are good. Apples are good. Why do you need to make this Frankenstein? And the third thing it says is that biotechnology is unnatural. Pears and apples, they just don't do this. Now, scientists that look at the, this picture will often have the response that, well, it's just a misunderstanding. We just need to share more information about the science behind it, about the principles, about the technology, and people will be totally cool with GMOs, and we can get on with building a better world. But I don't think this is a misunderstanding. I think that this, this reflects a deep unease with a complex technology. And I think it reflects a discomfort with a technology that has been largely the province of big companies. But I also think that this is an invitation for someone, somewhere, to stand up and say, I make GMOs, and this is why. And that's why I'm here today, because I make genetically modified organisms, and I make them because I believe biotechnology Biotechnology that is well-designed and carefully engineered, beautiful biotechnology, can make a difference in the world. So let's talk about beauty. How do you make a beautiful GMO? Now, this has very little to do with the end product. 
the microbe, the plant that you're engineering, it's not going to look very different from its wild cousin in most cases. But what can be strikingly beautiful is the way it is designed, the way it is integrated, and the processes that it ends up replacing. I'm going to give two examples here. Insulin and chymosin, both essential for human life. Insulin regulates sugar uptake, medicine for diabetics, and chymosin makes cheese. Now, these two proteins are produced in animal tissue, and we used to grind up animal tissue after animal tissue to extract the protein that we needed. But these days, using genetically modified bacteria, we can grow these in a broth of sugar and nutrients. Now, biotechnology hasn't made insulin and chymosin any prettier, but it has made them. It has made the process of making them a lot less gruesome, and I think that's beautiful. So if we have the opportunity to work with nature, to create with it, instead of destroying it, I think we should take it. And this isn't a new idea. We've been doing this for thousands of years. We've worked with nature to engineer more. More utility, more food, and more beauty. We could get away with one pink tulip, but we don't. We make many different kinds, because we like working with the natural world to meet our needs. And biotechnology is the latest way to do that. But like Kenneth mentioned earlier, more is not always just more. Sometimes it comes with a little extra. And biotechnology allows us to streamline the conventional process of making new organisms. So here's my recipe for beautiful biotechnology. It starts by working with nature. It starts by understanding and respecting the complexity of the living things that you are working with and integrating your goals into what those organisms already do. This is a comic that we made. It was the most popular post I think we've ever put up because there's a tendency for people to highlight uh, bioengineering as we can do it, no problem. Everything is easily programmable. But in reality, biology looks a lot more like this. This is a metabolic network of one single cell. Everything the cell makes, everything it consumes, every single second of every single day. All of these processes are going on at the same time. Now, there's a lot here, and it's kind of unmanageable, so let's zoom in. We'll zoom in on that part. Does this help? It's still pretty complicated. There's still a lot going on. But this is an accurate map. This is a good description of what is happening in your cell. And the reason we know this is because thousands of scientists have devoted years of research to understanding every single one of these processes from a wide variety of angles. We have a lot of knowledge about what happens in the cell. And maybe the most important part, that of the most important discovery that's come out of this is that most of these processes are the result of proteins, molecular machines inside the cell that perform specific functions and interact in complex networks. Now, the designs for these machines, the instructions for them, are contained in the code known as DNA. And this is at the heart of biotechnology, the idea that if we can make new instructions, we can build new machines. Or we can use existing instructions and combine them in new ways for a new purpose. We don't have to just look at the map. We can build new roads on it. Now, the process of building these roads, the process of developing new instructions, of genetically modifying an organism, this goes by many names. Genetic engineering is old school. Metabolic engineering is also there. Synthetic biology is the new one. But I prefer the term applied biology because that's exactly what we are doing. We're using our accumulated knowledge and applying it to find solutions to innovate and to discover. This is how digital technology is going to change everything. 
That slide I showed you had a lot of information, and every one of those lines had a lot of other information associated with it. That one map only tells half the story. It's more than any one person can hold in their head. But computers, computers can hold a lot more, and they can integrate a lot more. Watson, you may know him from Jeopardy. Well, they put him to work doing research. They fed him 70,000 papers that had been published around one single protein. And Watson was not only able to go through all of those papers and integrate all that data, he came up with this map of interactions, just like the one we already had, but he added seven new proteins and protein interactions that people later discovered independently. And he's also added two more that we have not yet, uh, not yet discovered experimentally. So Watson is not only able to build us maps, he can fill in the gaps we didn't know were there. That's incredible. This data-driven discovery is going to broaden our base of knowledge. Not only will we be able to integrate more data, we will be able to test it more quickly. Because digital technology is advancing to the point where robots can do experiments for us. And once you uh, are able to outsource the experimentation process, the how-to, the tool building, the tedious things that kind of get in the way of actually answering questions. Science becomes a creative discovery, and it, become, it comes out of those back rooms in industry, and it comes out of academia, and it makes it so anyone, so that you could come up with a question and have it analyzed and look at the results. And you may need some expertise to figure out exactly what experiments you have to run, but you can discover something with the help of digital technology. The second element to this recipe is to think big picture. How is biotechnology going to fit in to whatever situation you're trying to solve? Uh, I'm going to give an example of uh, something Andrew spoke about earlier. He was talking about vision problems. One uh, source of vision problems in the world is vitamin A deficiency. This affects uh, 600,000 people across the world, and many of them are children. Now, vitamin A deficiency and micronutrient deficiencies, well, to fix them, you need to provide the nutrients. But pills can often be too expensive for poor families. And uh, pills can often be too expensive for poor families, and they often aren't taken either. So the best way to do this is to incorporate it into the diet. Now, there are two options here. One is to find a plant that already gives you the nutrients you need. And that's what happened in Africa. Africa uh, ate a lot of sweet potatoes, and groups came in and said, we are going to fix this problem. The white sweet potatoes, which you know and love and are a part of your culture, those don't help your vision. But the orange sweet potatoes, those, those are good for you. Those will supplement your vitamin A. But they didn't just hand them to the communities. They sang songs about them. They put on plays about them. They had the healthy baby competitions, and they did recipe swaps. And they engaged the community in an active discussion of this new food source. Because it takes a lot for people to incorporate new ideas on a topic like food. It takes a lot for you to change your culture and change your attitude towards something that is as close to home as food. Now, Asia also has a problem with vitamin A deficiency. But rice is the major starch there, and rice doesn't have a good alternative that can help supplement these, the vitamin A deficiency. So scientists decided to provide one. And now there is a choice between a white rice and an orange rice, just like there was a choice between a white sweet potato and an orange sweet potato. But the problem is, the scientists didn't sing songs about their rice, and they didn't have healthy baby competitions. And as a result, the label GMO and the cultural bias that attends that has really colored the picture here. It has led people to burn field trials, and it's led people not only in the community that need it, but also in the communities that don't to protest the introduction of, of a plant like this. Now, the last bit of beautiful biotechnology is, I think, to answer the questions that the culture really wants to know. And for my project in particular, I'm working with plants 
They're part of an ecosystem. We need to understand how they relate to pollinators, how they, relate, how they could relate to the wild cousins that are out there. This meant we talked with experts who study insects and how they interact with flowers that change color. It meant that we spoke with uh, hybridizers and floriculture people. And we realized that over uh, hundreds of years of hybridizing petunias, there was no gene flow back to the wild type. So we picked an organism that would minimize our, our impact on the environment. These are things that we take into consideration, and they're things every project should take into, into consideration and answer honestly. Now, one of the most interesting things about this has been the fact that the people that are most excited about what we do are the artists. We have had artists from England and all over the world contact us about the color-changing flowers because they want to get involved. They can imagine a new world where we're not constrained by fear, but we're considering how we can build the world we want to see with this technology. And we're thrilled to be working with uh, Dr. Helen Story on a dress that features the flowers that change color. Beauty, beauty is a way to communicate. And science and art have a lot more in common than I ever expected. We both ask questions. We both find answers. We have to creatively approach the world and determine new things about it. Sometimes our work runs headlong into uncomfortable truths. And sometimes it directly challenges the status quo. And I know that's what I'm doing with my project, challenging the status quo. I'm calling for you to think twice about what a GMO is and what it could be, and how your own cultural bias affects the way you look at them. Because well-engineered biotechnology can be inspirational and transformative. It can be beautiful. And beauty, beauty can change the world. Thank you.